Hi, everyone. My name is Kathy Baxter, and I am Principal Architect of Ethical AI Practice at Salesforce. I'm really sorry I can't be with you in person today, but I appreciate the opportunity to share with you how we create an ethical AI practice at Salesforce. I'd first like to begin by sharing an observation that my coworker Yoav Schlesinger made. He observed that major technological advancements rarely ever begin as safe, inclusive, or focused on long-term societal impacts. Um, thinking back to the late 1800s with medications that were designed to help relieve pain, uh, we have this amusing cartoon or advertisement um, uh, for cocaine toothache drops for children. Obviously not a great idea. We move into the food industry where uh, productionized or, or factory line food was designed to feed the masses and yet that didn't work out so well. We had mass produced food poisoning and very low quality controls. Uh, cars uh, on the same road as trolleys and horses and pedestrians with no laws, no regulations in place, um, and no thoughts about long-term environmental or societal impacts of those vehicles as they went along in time. And then finally, we have uh, in the 1940s, the creation of synthetic pesticides. And here we have an advertisement uh, that is very typical of those you would find in those days of housewives being encouraged to use pesticides like DDT in their homes. And so you see uh, images of them spraying DDT in their kitchen cabinets and around cribs because that's the responsible thing to do. And of course, we know there have been um, uh, studies that have shown terrible long-term impacts uh, on humans and, and crops in the environment um, uh, of the use of DDT and other similar synthetic pesticides. Well, AI really is no different in these terms. Uh, here are just some of the many headlines over the last few months from around the world. We have headlines from the US, UK, Spain, Singapore. I mean, they're, they're from all over in, uh, demonstrating that AI has the potential and has actually caused real harm. But in other ways, AI is much different in terms of the speed and scale of its impact. It is outsized. So when we look at the estimated number of cars that will be on the roads globally by 2025, we see that the time to reach 1.4 billion drivers globally was 139 years. Whereas if we look at the impact, the number of social media users, it will have taken only 21 years to reach 4.5 billion social media users. And it's the AI that powers the recommendation engines that fuel much of that social media consumption. So when we talk about ethical AI, what do we really mean? Like what is an ethical AI practice? So I thought I'd begin by sharing with you our trusted AI principles at Salesforce. And you can see, um, read more about these yourself at the URL on the screen. Just very briefly, we believe that AI must be responsible, accountable, transparent, empowering, and inclusive. And we must be responsible to protect human rights and the data that our customers entrust us with. Our AI must be accountable to everyone, adhering to regulations and being accountable to our customers and society. We commit to being transparent. How is our AI making the recommendations or the predictions that it is? And then how have we built our models? So we produce or we publish model cards to help communicate how we trained and built our models. We believe that AI must be empowering of everyone. We want, we believe in the power of AI augmenting, not replacing humans. And we also believe in the importance of giving our customers the power, the education, the control to be able to use our AI responsibly. And finally, AI must be inclusive of everyone that it impacts, 
not just those that created it. I'd like to now share with you our ethical AI maturity model. And you can see the report to go in that goes into more details of this maturity model at the shrink link on the screen, capital E-A-I-M-M. We developed this model based on our experience of developing an ethical AI practice at Salesforce going back to 2016. And then we validated this with other uh, individuals on ethical AI teams at other major tech companies that have also had a, an ethical AI team for many years. And they validated that this was also representative of how they went about creating an ethical AI practice at their company. To begin with, your first stage we describe as ad hoc. This has typically involved an individual at a company raising their hand and asking tough questions, like not just can we do this, but should we do this? This begins an informal advocacy and a groundswell among other individuals in the company that start asking similar questions and have similar concerns. And so at this point, you might begin doing informal reviews with teams that really care about this and want to think about and ensure what they are building is safe and, and uh, responsible. Moving into the next stage, it really is defined by getting that executive level buy-in. This means that executives in your company are really committed to providing the resources to make change and ensure that what you are building is responsible. And that often begins by creating a trusted AI principles, like I showed you a moment ago, guidelines and commitments. It can take a year or more to develop those and get them signed off throughout the company uh, and across all of your executives. Now, you could take existing principles like those created by the OECD and simply add those to your website or say, this is what we are going to commit to. But it, we believe that it's really important to contextualize those principles to your company. What does it mean to be safe or fair or transparent? What are the specific commitments that your company is willing to make to adhere to those principles? At this point, you may be building a team, hopefully of diverse experts, and starting to educate everyone in your company, or at least those that are building and creating or using AI to use it responsibly. What is bias? What is fairness? What are the steps we need to take to ensure that it is responsible? And then at this point, more formal reviews probably are taking place, but often these are tacked on to the end of a product development life cycle. It makes sense. It has the least friction. It's the easiest place to add on additional reviews and not be viewed as slowing the process down. Of course, it also means that if you find any large issues, there's very little time to address it, so it's not ideal. Moving into the third stage of managed and sustainable, this is now where you see that ethical considerations are built in throughout the product development life cycle. So there is actually a point in the beginning where you ask, should we even begin building this? Should this exist in the first place? And this is where you can have the most impact. You probably at this point, if you haven't already, are looking at buying or building bias and fairness assessment tooling to help your engineers or data scientists be able to identify if there's bias in the data sets or models. And at this point, you're likely developing metrics to be able to measure how you are doing over time. In the final stage of optimized and innovative, this is where we see AI ethics, responsibilities, and owners throughout the entire company, not just engineering or product management or data science, but also represented in legal, privacy, user experience, sales, marketing, because it's an end-to-end, -end, it's a company-wide effort. 
Also, at this point, you have a formal process of being able to identify ethical debt when something is launched, but there's more work that needs to be done, maybe to address more bias, create more representative data sets, and it's added onto the, uh, onto the backlog, and there's actually a formal process for identifying this and resolving this over time. And you may even have uh, blocking mechanisms so that there are poor ethics me uh, metrics, then it can block a launch. Now, another observation that my coworker, uh, Yoav Schlesinger, observed is that this is very similar to Patrick Hudson's safety ladder. Patrick Hudson is a well-known uh, safety uh, international safety expert, and this is the safety ladder that he spent time researching and developing. And if we lay our ethical AI maturity model on top of it, we can see there's a lot of similarities. And I think this is incredibly uh, positive because the safety industry has been around for a long time. There's a lot of regulation and practice and processes to put in place. And so to be able to see that there are similarities in how a safety culture evolves, uh, and it's similar to how we have observed of developing an ethical culture, this is very positive. So in those beginning stages where you have moved on from the pathological of who cares as long as we don't get caught into the more ad hoc or reactive stage where you're just addressing issues as they happen to come up, like after an accident, after um, a, 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 a bad headline, when bias has been identified. Then you're moving into the calculative stage. Now you actually have these organized, repeatable kinds of processes in place to be able to manage all kinds of hazards or ethical risks. In the proactive stage, this is where you have more tools and resources so that you are working on all of the problems and trying to prevent them in advance before they ever happen. And then in the final stage, where this is where your, your culture is established. Safety is just how we do business around here, or ethics is just how we do business around here. I want to close by, sh by sharing five aspects of a safety culture that Patrick identified. And again, these map incredibly well to an ethical culture. First is the importance of leadership, that leaders aren't afraid to do the right thing, even when it's difficult and no one else is doing it. There's respect for the individuals that have to do this work and the dangers that they may face. So in the case of gig workers or employees that are using AI that might have bias or it might not be representative of all, there's a respect for all of the individuals in the company that are doing this work or interacting with the AI, potentially their jobs being automated and what impact that has on them. Experts in the company are listened to regardless of where they are in the company hierarchy. And managers know what's really going on in the company because employees aren't hiding things. They aren't afraid to speak truth to power. They can raise issues. They can share whenever they've made an error or there's been some kind of a miss because they know that it's more important. There's a reward for being transparent. And it's not about consequences and trying to hide when things go wrong. There's a real mindfulness in the company. Everyone's aware. I like to call it uh, an ethical spidey sense. This is where everyone in the company, they may not know exactly why something is not quite right. They might not know how to mitigate a risk or a harm, but they know that something isn't right. And they're constantly vigilant, looking for those opportunities and raising a hand whenever they see something. Justice and fairness is incredibly important. You need to be ensure you need to ensure that there are clear lines between what is acceptable and what is unacceptable and everyone knows what those lines are and everyone agrees what those line, lines are from top to bottom and that there are clear consequences and rewards in place when those uh, when those red lines are are met versus when they're crossed. And so everyone from top to bottom 
adheres to these and sees to it that they are observed. And then finally, you have a real learning culture. Everyone's willing to adapt and implement how they work and create and implement those reforms when things go wrong, even when they're costly or there may be uh, critical sacrifices that have to be made as a result. I want to thank you so much for all of your time today and look forward to your questions.